Hello and welcome. This is the second modeling lecture for the Stream Ecology course, and this one deals with a different type of food web theory called size spectra analysis. Now I'll talk about this later, but actually originally I had planned to do quite a bit of work on this with you and the students in the class actually going out and collecting materials from streams this summer, but unfortunately we won't be able to do that. But size spectra analysis is a relatively simple way to view the world and try to understand how uh, food webs are operating within it. Size spectra is founded on a few basic principles, one of which is that big things eat little things in aquatic systems. And this is generally the case, albeit that in terrestrial systems, this can be a little bit wonky, especially with organisms that can cut, break, uh, and eat their food in part, like humans, for instance, that can eat much larger animals than themselves. But in any case, in the aquatic systems, it's very, very common that large animals can eat little animals and that we don't see small animals eating very, very large animals. Okay, And this is results in a, a biological phenomenon called gape limitation, which is that organisms can feed only as large as the mouth can open because they're not going to pull and rip pieces. They're going to tend to consume the whole thing all at once. Now feeding is more than just simply getting something into your mouth. It then has to pass through some area like an esophagus into a stomach. And the actual size of the organism's head is going to limit how large a prey item can fit down the entire esophagus, right? You can't have a prey item that's so large that you can't get it down your throat. And you can see that animals have been choking to death as a result of that on food items for a long time. Here's a picture of a pike that tried to feed on a bass and ended up choking. It couldn't actually get the bass down. Here's a picture of a dolphin, right? This isn't just all the stupid fish. It's also dolphins that try to eat an octopus and the octopus tried to crawl back out and got stuck in the throat. And then the dolphin eventually choked to death. And at the bottom, just to convince you that this is not some sort of novel thing, which has just recently appeared, here's a fossilized fish with another fossilized fish in its mouth that died while it was choking on another fish. So clearly, this pattern has been a long and continuous process. And that means that size is going to be directly related to the size of the organism that is being consumed. So the size of the predator is going to be very strongly correlated with the size of the largest prey to make it consume. And so not only does big eat small, but it's predictable how big an organism is that's on the diet of that predator. So those two things together are going to be very, very useful. As soon as we start to talk about predictability, then we can start to deal with things in a mathematical universe. And a lot of organisms take advantage of this. So for instance, here's a sunfish. If we were out in the field, you would have seen a lot of these. But what you can see is that this is the, the maximum depth is right here on the sunfish. Okay. And there has evolved a, a bony extension at exactly that point, which expands the maximum depth. So it becomes much more difficult for predators to eat. So it shrinks the number of predators which can feed on it. This bone here, a spine, and this spine here can be locked in an upright position. And that substantially increases, you can see that, the total depth of that fish. In fact, it's just off the screen. And that means that if you're a predator, yes, it may look like you can eat this fish until you try to get it in your mouth and then it erects those bony spurs. And it costs very little to make bone relative to making a huge big body. And so these animals have evolved this system to help protect them, right? So that system is a long-standing and continuous pressure in these, in these environments. Another feature that size spectra is built upon is the foundation that there is a loss of energy or material as you move up through the system. And that's because of the second law of thermodynamics, which I already mentioned in the prior lecture, but which I'm going to show you in this lecture. But first, let me just show you what that eventually makes. So it makes something like this trophic pyramid in a very simple world, right? It takes a lot of algae to make some amount of uh, herbivore, and that amount of herbivore can be converted into predators and if that amount of predator can only be converted into a very very small amount of top level predator and the the general rule is that it's about 10 percent of the material at the bottom can be converted into material on the next trophic level and so that means as you can see here that if you were to go up one more level right you could only make 0.1 pounds of organisms that were feeding off of sharks. And that means that you're going to have a limitation on how large these systems can be 
or how deep these, I should say, these trophic levels can go, because at some point, even if you had all of the algae in the world, right, that you could feed to, to some organisms, you would still not be able to make enough organisms that, that say whatever that trophic level was, that there would be two of them or just a few of them in the environment to reproduce. And this is built on the fact that there's a second law of thermodynamics. And in the second law of thermodynamics, it states that there's an all energy exchanges, no energy enters or leaves the system, and the potential energy of the state will always be less than that of the initial state, which is a long way of saying that all processes require a loss of energy to move forward. So if you are uh, in using, let's say, your car engine and you're burning gas, you create heat as a byproduct of that. You can't simply take the energy out of the gas and get a one-to-one -one conversion for distance. You lose some of that as heat. And this is true in all processes, right? So the process of making a fish body from eating another animal relies on exactly the same process that your car relies on to burn fuel and move it forward. And if your car is generating heat, then the animal body will also generate heat. Now animals are far more efficient than your car, but they simply cannot be 100% efficient. It's impossible in this universe based on the second law. So you can make a system like this, right? There can be a ton of light energy that comes in, but some of it has to be lost, and often a huge amount of it is lost. And then there's a small amount that's converted into a primary producer. And the smaller amount of that primary producer can be converted into a primary consumer and so forth and so on up the food chain. And hence the reason that whales are relatively rare, right? These are very large organisms. They often feed at very high trophic levels and that it takes a lot of energy to build these bodies. So it is in part difficult to make lots of whales in the world, right? The diversity of whales is relatively low whales and I should say dolphins and porpoises because it's hard to make really high trophic level consumers. And part of the reason that large whales tend to feed on very small organisms is because there's no way you could make such a large whale by depending on sort of larger fish because you simply could not have enough fish in the ocean to do that. So you could also make it look like this, right? I showed you that trophic, that pyramid before, and that is a kind of a uh, really fancy way of doing it. But let's get back to that idea of let's make a box, a rectangle, right? We love rectangles. They're really easy to measure. You multiply the X and the Y and you get the area inside of it. Really nice stuff. Love that. And let's imagine that we take the mass of the uh, material that is in these groups. So you can see here, I've stacked them up at about 10% 10, 10 intervals. So if we start with 100 down here, this one is 10, this one is a 1, and then this one up here is 0 0.1, okay? Whatever units I'm using. But you're going to have this 10% loss, a very simple system here, and I've only gone up to some tertiary consumer. Now keep in mind, and I'm assuming, as I did in the prior modeling chapter, that we move always up from the trophic level below. We never feed by jumping from another trophic level. So for instance, this tertiary consumer up here is never feeding on primary producers. If it did, its biomass could be larger. But if it fed on these primary producers, then presumably some of these secondary and primary consumers would have to decrease in size uh, or their bin would have to decrease in size because some of the energy that was available to them is being converted elsewhere into biomass. So it's assuming that this system, again, has got some static amount of energy in it that we're drawing from, okay? And we can think of maybe this as, it's gonna be related, again, thinking about production, to the amount of those organisms in the environment, right? There's not gonna be one giant thing at the tertiary consumer. There's gonna be a lot of tertiary consumers, otherwise they couldn't reproduce, and they're gonna be some average size within that, okay? And that makes, again, it's very similar to how you were doing production before, so this isn't really much of a stretch yet. This is an ugly pyramid. Now, if we say push all those to the side, right, then you could make some relationship here. You could draw a line. So if we take the point right at the edge of these rectangles, right, there's a there is some exponential decline in the number of consumers as you move up the trophic level, which, you, again, you already saw visually and that makes intuitive sense. But now you can actually see mathematically. Right. There's going to be this very small numbers of these relative to the biomass because they simply can't be tons of them. You don't have enough primary to do producers to do it. Connect the points, right, and you get that nice little line. Okay. We hate 
curved lines. Curved lines require um, often multiple different parameters. Multiple parameters means multiple levels of uncertainty. Multiple levels of uncertainty lead to very, very large error bars and therefore very minimal understanding of what's going on in the system. But if you take a curved line like this and you take the log, the natural log of both axes, then you get a straight line and straight lines now we love straight lines. There's only a couple things you can estimate. The intercept and the slope. And that is really nice. So if we take the abundance of these organisms, the log of the abundance of these organisms, okay, that'll be this one axis. And if on the other axis now we just maintain trophic level, we'll get a nice straight line. Sweet. That's pretty cool. And we can now get really pretty and simple estimates, right? We can use a simple equation like y equals mx plus b to estimate the slope and intercept of that line. Hmm, that's cool. All right. But trophic level, as I alluded to before, because it's related to the way in which these organisms feed, is going to be related to the size of these organisms in the environment frequently. And so we don't necessarily know the trophic level of an organism, but we can easily measure the size of that organism. So if we do that, maybe we can do it this way. Measure, maybe we measure organism sizes, okay? And you get, again, you get an ugly curve again, right? That's an ugly curve. Sorry, I didn't make it down to that little one down there. I just couldn't, couldn't do it as, pretty, as uh, cutely as I do with a PowerPoint. And you get that curve. And if you have an ugly curve like this, then you should take the log of it on the other axis. And when you do, you return to your straight line. And good, so now if we have organism size here, and as a log of organism size and a log of abundance, then we'll end up with another straight line. So we got back to that y equals mx plus b thing. So that's useful. Okay, so we maintained our straight line. And if we just turn it to the side, it makes more sense, right? What we're really interested often is predicting the abundance of organisms, okay? And often what we can measure easily is the organism size. So all we have to do is just turn it so it makes sense when we actually go about making predictions. And all of a sudden, all you have to do is go out, measure the density of organisms in the environment, and measure their actual size. And then you can start to predict how many there should be there. And that's really useful because let's say that I want to know how many fish are in the environment, but I don't want to collect every fish. I want to collect some of the fish. Well, maybe I collect smaller fish and then I try to predict how many large fish are out there. Or maybe I say how many fish should be here if I measure all the algae in the system. Hmm, that's interesting too. Right, and ultimately what this is, the log of abundance, log of size, is a size spectrum. So it's just a simple linear line fit to something very, very, very easily measured in the environment, density and the size of those organisms. Now go back to what I said about this pyramid. I said generally we use the assumption that it's 10% efficiency, so 1,000 to 100 to 10 to 1, okay? Well, that actually turns out to be very important, right? Because if that is in fact the case, and we have used logs, log base 10, right? Then we're using a scale of one, right? Every time we move forward one step with a logarithm, we're using one unit more on that scale. And if we're moving equally one unit on each axis, right? Then we have really easily predictable slopes. The slope will be one. And since we've moved it so it actually goes down and to the right, then it's negative one. So we would predict, anticipate, and we should hope to see that with size spectra, we should get slopes around negative one. Wow, is that pretty, right? If this 10% rule is right, we should anticipate that negative one should appear for us when we go on and measure it. And that's really, really easy to deal with. Dealing with is the number one, or is it not, right? We're not gonna deal with lots of variability. We're looking to see if that negative one appears.
And lo and behold, when you go out into systems, you can find slopes that are very close to that. And slopes that are more negative suggest that larger organisms are less abundant than you would expect. And slopes that are more positive, right, that are closer to, let's say, 0 0.9, 0 0.8, 0 0.7, mean that large organisms are very, very abundant relative to how, how many you expect to be out there. And you can do it by keep, and you can add tons of, of different groups in here, right? You could measure very small things to very large things. Now, this is a size spectra developed from a lake, and I know we've dealt with stream ecology. So I wanted to show you some examples of real data first, but I want you to understand uh, that these uh, relationships are, are widely used in um, lake systems as well. And you can also do this with lots and lots and lots of data. So this is huge quantities of data. And you get really cool dome-shaped patterns, which I'm not going to deal with. But I want you to see that there's lots of underlying theory right, that you could explore with this. And you can see that you can group these by basic group. right? Zooplankton actually do make up something like a dome. And it's related to how they're feeding. And as you can see, you can make predictions out to even predatory fish, potentially. Again, another lake system here. This is Lake Superior's food web. And there's other times where violations can appear, right? You're always assuming big eats small, and sometimes big doesn't eat small. Things like crayfish can rip things up, so that isn't a big thing necessarily eating a small thing. It can be a big thing eating a big thing. Parasites actually do it the opposite way. Small eats big. And so if parasites are really abundant in your system, maybe size spectra could be violated another way. Benthivores, I've already alluded to something about, well, they're not using the same food web that we often think about. And what about organisms like salmon that are moving in and out of a system? So they're taking materials outside of the system and bring it in or moving materials from inside the system out of the system. And so they're not limited by thinking about a static energy box in the system, their energy box is actually from many, many other energy boxes. Uh, some questions you could ask with that. Mostly you can think about those as, with these violations, do we see the rule break or bend, or does it continue to follow the pattern we expect? And what about those uh, domes that we see, those humps that we see on those lines? How do we explain those? A lot of this, again, I set up to ask for you to ask questions so that you could go out and actually start to look at some of these. But these would make sort of interesting individual pieces, may make interesting projects for an SMP uh, project if you were considering that uh, for your work. But size spectra, okay, so there's all these exceptions. Does it actually work? Well, Remember, if we assume that, okay, size spectra isn't going to work, we're going to give up on it. It's just too, it's just, there's just too many reasons why it's just not going to work, right? We can think of a bunch. Then we need to move to complexity. And when you move towards complexity, then you have to start to think about everything, right? And then it becomes really difficult because there are a lot of organisms in it. I always love this because this is Lake Ontario Food Web and it shows all of these fish up here. Right. Oh, here's all these fish. Tries to break them out by group. And then for things like zooplankton, it just like it just groups them by huge groups. Or for algae, it's like, oh, here's green ones and blue green ones and flagellates. Right. Huge, huge, huge number of species located within there. So really, in this complex food web, the complexity is stored up here and they start to reduce complexity very, very quickly. If you really start to try to keep track of species and you have to deal with huge numbers of species, right? In just like a great lake, you'd have to deal with something like 300 species. Open to be 100. In any stream, you could expect to see huge numbers like this. Fish species in the lakes are 80. I guarantee that if we went to the streams in Maryland, you'd be in that ballpark. Uh, even if we did know, we still would need substantial computing power to actually do calculations about how these species are interacting with each other. So if we try to just build out complexity, and our target is also constantly changing, right? There's new species being introduced. Climate change is always changing the way in which species interact. We have nutrient changes. There's lots of other human impacts that are going on. Does adding complexity really help us? Right? You get to super complex things like this. And even here, we've limited complexity. Here's all of the different groups of phytoplankton listed as, quote, phytoplankton. Again, not, not a stream food web, 
but understand that you could make a stream food web as complicated as this without an issue. And look at all these interactions you have to parameterize, right? If you say, I need to know how all of these things interact, just asking what organisms feed on detritus would be difficult. You'd have to figure that out. And then for each one of these lines that you see, right, you have to know what percentage of that detritus is being brought into that group. So you're going to need to parameterize huge numbers of things. And the odds of you parameterizing all that in a single season or year, well, if you didn't get it in that year, is next year as good as this year? Is it telling you the same thing? Are you going to have to rely on other people's studies? Right. So there are all sorts of questions. So complexity does not necessarily just get us away from some of these issues. So while size spectra may have some weaknesses, and it does, it makes some assumptions that are clearly violated. We have to decide how badly violated those assumptions are. So badly we can't use it. So badly it can provide us just a general guide. Not very much. So we could use it pretty well to predict things, right? Where are we on that scale? And that is a question we could certainly look at. So sometimes a simpler option can be better, the sort of the magic bullet approach, even if it's not perfect. Right. So it is difficult to parameterize human models. So maybe the size spectra is a better solution and you're really only dealing with two things. And you know that even people that are relatively untrained can collect these easily. So you can get lots of data over long time periods. So you can compare seasons for long periods of time. And that is very cool. You don't have to do really high level stuff. You don't need the species. And that's great because we don't want to deal with species when we deal with aquatic macroinvertebrates. We don't have to worry about the condition of the organisms. We don't have to worry about how old they are. We don't have to worry about any of that stuff. We can just ask really simple questions. And as I've already alluded to, producing linear relationships, I love linear relationships. And one of the most annoying things about size spectra is that frequently it's referred to as abundant size spectra. Uh, that does not lend itself to acronyms particularly well. So has this been done in streams? And the answer is yes, but mostly no. And few studies have actually looked at size spectra in streams. So this is a really an interesting place for scientists to spend time studying. And there's lots of opportunity for it. This is one of the reasons I was really excited to potentially do it this summer was because there was a lot of potential researchers could be generated very quickly, which we have not yet examined and which we could ask about. The uh, picture on the left here, I should say the figure on the left here is from this paper, and it just shows you some size spectra in different streams. That's what the different dots are in different months. Right. And it asks, does the slope change between different months? So you can see that listed on here. Does the intercept matter? I haven't talked about intercept and size spectra, but it also is a parameter you could be interested in. Does it change between different streams? Does it change if you only look at certain size groups? Right. Maybe you look at this. You can see that there's a hole basically in the middle of all of these. Right, there's a missing hole here. That's interesting. What is that filled by? Maybe you could ask questions about uh, whether certain streams tended to have more or less uh, applicability uh, for use of this parameter. Can you detect other things? You can see that these slopes are very, very negative relative to what we expect, right? So large organisms are, tend to be missing from these systems, and that's very interesting. We have way more small organisms than large th organisms uh, based on these slopes. So we don't necessarily provide, produce the negative one relationship we anticipate. That's very cool. And I want to encourage you that if any of this is interesting to you and you're thinking about this, think about this as an undergraduate research project. It would be very easy to go into a couple of streams and spend some time doing nothing but getting densities of organisms and their size and asking, do they meet that expectation of negative one? And if they don't, why might that not be the case? Very, very cool, very, very cutting edge science, which needs to be done. Uh, streams are right there. They, this tool needs to be a, a, to used in streams so we can know better about whether it's useful there or not. And widely used in marine and to a degree in lake systems. All right, and now that wraps up two modeling lectures. And we're going to move on to the river continuum concept. And the river continuum concept is going to take a lot of these ideas about how organisms interact with each other and how the environment changes those organisms and how the organisms change the environment and bring them all together simultaneously.